Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Pierpaolo, and I'd like to welcome you to the third day of the 2021 Youth Environmental Summit. Today, with our session, Turning Passion into Power, Youth Advocacy. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our attendees that everyone is muted with video off. Please use the comment feature to the right of the screen throughout this session to share your questions or comments with our presenters. We'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the session. Uh, we also have a facilitated Q&A at the end where you can grab the mic, uh, as they put it here, by clicking the icon in the bottom corner, and we'll bring you up on the screen to ask a question. Please also feel free to use the reaction features in the bottom right uh, if you have a new idea, or if you hear a new idea, want to share applause or celebrate. A couple more notes of etiquette. Uh, you should not access the grab the mic feature unless the speaker states so, and we'll have that at the end. Um, when speaking by contributing to activities or discussions, please use appropriate language and a clear voice. When you are ending your conversation on the stage, uh, respectfully leave. Uh, there are two minutes timers of when you come up on the stage. And uh, during that time, you can ask your question and afterward they will respond. Um, respect the speaker by listening attentively. Listen and be considerate to others. Do not comment any impolite statements to those speaking. If you have any questions, utilize the comment box, uh, as stated before, and be mindful of your background when you are on the stage. I'd like to take a moment to thank our wonderful sponsors, as you see up on screen now, for their generous support of this year's conference. Make sure to check out their booths in between sessions. All right, so with that, I'm very happy to introduce to you County Executive Matt Meyer. Mr. Meyer is a graduate of Brown University and University of Michigan Law School. He grew up in Cardiff off Shipley Road, attended Brandywine School District schools, and graduated from Wilmington Friends School. Matt Meyer was first elected to serve as the Chief Executive of Delaware's largest county in 2016. He launched NCC Innovates, the most extensive effort to start and grow small business in county history and created Green CC, an ambitious agenda to address climate change, preserve open space, bikeable, walkable trails, and clean water. The Meyer administration eliminated wasteful spending and streamlined government expenditures, creating a rapid response jobs now program that facilitated development project with over 12,000 jobs. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming County Executive Matt Meyer. Thank you so much, uh, Pierre Paolo. I, I really appreciate the uh, the kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, not only with uh, Senator Hansen, who I'll talk about in a minute, but she's really a leader uh, in environmental issues in the state and the region and has been for decades, but also Councilwoman Durham uh, and Melissa Tracy are also in the room, it seems. And my understanding is Councilwoman D. Durham uh, and Melissa Tracy, who are you know, a tremendous environmental leaders in their own right are the founders of Delaware Yes. So I just want to thank you both for creating this summit. Uh, that my only my only regret is why didn't you do it when I was in high school? Because uh, I would have loved the opportunity to uh, participate uh, in this. I'm going to uh, take about 20 minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, about uh, county government, about what uh, Councilwoman Diller and I, are, uh, I'm sorry, Councilwoman Durham and I, D. Durham and I are uh, trying to accomplish uh, together. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about what you can do, some specific things. I think I have a list of five specific things uh, that you can do. My story starts in Delaware. As was mentioned, I grew up off Shipley Road. I went to Brandywine School District Schools and then went to Wilmington Friends for uh, junior high and, uh, and high school. I was not, uh, I, I was environmentalist. I wasn't big into outdoorsy stuff really until after college, I moved to Kenya. And in Kenya, I got really into hiking and just uh, enjoying the natural world and the natural environment. I ended up getting really, really into it, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, which is one of the largest peaks in the world in Tanzania, in East Africa. I, I climbed most of the way up Mount Rainier out in the state of Washington. 
Um, I, I summited Mount Whitney, which is the tallest mountain in the lower 48 states. And I go on two or three week hikes at a time with friends, just a backpack. Sometimes we didn't even bring a tent. We'd sleep under a, a, a tarp in some of the most beautiful parts of the country in the Grand Canyon in Montana and something called the John Muir Trail through the Sierra Nevadas in, in California. A tremendous respect, uh, almost a holiness of nature, and that we all have a responsibility, each and every one of us, to make sure that we don't disturb that holiness, that spiritual goodness that comes from simply a stream flowing, the wind blowing through a tree, um, or things like that. And I know that there are uh, some scientists on here who know better than me how, how critical it is to our ecosystem and our survival as a species, as humanities, and to, the, um, to sustaining our community here in Newcastle County, that we have a tremendous amount of respect for things like native species, which uh, Senator Hansen, I'm sure, will, will speak about. Uh, about 20 years ago, the environmental movement in Newcastle County, in many ways, was led by then County Council President uh, Stephanie Hansen. Um, she subsequently, I think three years ago now, uh, four years ago now, ran for a Senate seat and became a state senator. And it's an honor to share the floor with her today and take questions uh, with her. We um, have collaborated on, on a number of things, along with Councilwoman D. Durham, just to make sure that we here in Newcastle County and in our state, state of Delaware, are really on the forefront of protecting our land, air, and water, not just for my generation, but for, for your generation, for the next generation, so that you can enjoy uh, the same natural uh, world that we uh, enjoy. I have a little uh, PowerPoint presentation here. I imagine you've seen quite a a few uh, these days. I'm going to share it real quick. I want to take a minute to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, county government. A lot of people don't know what county government is. I didn't have a complete understanding of what county government was when I started in this job uh, four years ago. Um, there is, uh, as you know, there's a federal government based in Washington. There's a state government based in Dover. And the state government has a governor and a state legislature, a House and a Senate, just like the federal government has a president and a, a Senate and a House. Similarly, county government has a county executive, that's me, and a county council. And Councilwoman Durham is one of 13 county council members. Senator Hansen, who you're going to hear from, is, of course, the state senator down in Dover. And the state government and county government have different functions, sometimes overlapping, like we've we've collaborated quite a bit on COVID-19, um, but there are also different things that we do. Up in the upper left corner, uh, you can see a picture there of some of our sewer staff. We maintain uh, sanitary uh, sewers and, and, and parkland. Uh, we also have 15 libraries, county libraries, Route 9 Library, Brandy 100 Library, Bear Library, Middletown Library, the Apple Library. Uh, we also, as you can see from the pipe, do quite a bit of work. As I mentioned, the sewer, we have the largest sanitary sewer system. We have nearly 50 miles of pathways, bike, bikeable, walkable pathways. We have Newcastle County Police, which is 400 police officers, 410 police officers, the largest, uh, the second largest police agency uh, in the state. We also run the paramedic service, you can see in the bottom right, and uh, also the 911 center. And particularly with regard to parkland, land use, sewers, uh, environmental issues are really in the forefront of what we do. And uh, when uh, when I started this job four years ago, five years ago now, I ran for office for the first time in, in my life. Or I should say the second time. The first time was a student council in high school. And when I was in 11th grade and decided to run for, for student council, uh, nobody thought I could win then. I wasn't tremendously popular. Uh, and I pulled an upset victory off. Uh, and I won. Uh, and the same thing happened five years ago. I ran against a, a three-term incumbent, somebody who'd been in the office for a long time, uh, and, and we won. And one thing that was really important to me was based on my experience traveling, hiking uh, around, the, around the country and to some extent in Africa, around the world, it was really important to me that we preserve open space, that we protect forests and natural habitats, that we improve water quality, that we promote renewables and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, one thing I've learned that I know Senator Hansen knows well, I know Councilwoman Durham knows well, I know Melissa Tracy knows well, but you may not all realize this stuff is often easy to say, but 
it can be really hard to stand up and do things. You get pushback. There are often people that do not want to, for example, protect the coastal zone, which is an, a, an area along the Delaware River, a zone that was created almost 50 years ago um, to, to protect development in those areas, to make sure that we're not uh, polluting the Delaware River, polluting our waterways, doing something like two years ago, along with Councilwoman Deller, we stood up against a a, a, a large uh, landfill, one of the largest corporations, uh, uh, waste management corporations in the in the world, a fifty billion dollar company, to make sure that they couldn't uh, increase the size of a large landfill in a working class community in Newcastle County, and they were willing to throw all sorts of money at making sure that they can increase their landfill. And we we stood up and, and did not let them do that. So uh, sometimes in this job, you, you got to have courage to do what is right. And you got to really stick your stick your neck out and take some heat to do these things on our agenda, preserving open space, protecting forests and natural habitats, improving water quality and promoting renewables, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a couple of years ago, we proposed an environmental legislation package that we call Green NCC. Um, we've been told it's the most ambitious green agenda in the history of Newcastle County government. Now, when you talk about green with respect to Newcastle County, keep in mind that what we're really talking about is uh, sewers. How do we how do we uh, reduce water usage and protect consumers and the public so that they're only, they only are using safe, drinkable water uh, through our sanitary sewer system, which is the largest sanitary sewer system in the state. How do we uh, use our parklands and all of our open space to make sure that we're protecting wildlife habitats, that we are um, you know, protecting air, making sure that uh, forestation is happening, that the number of trees and green spaces are increasing uh, and not Decreasing, and the the third way in which we really seriously engage with the environment is our land use department. When uh, someone wants to build a mall or a store, in addition to their business or home, they need to go to the land use department and get a rezoning or get a permit. Uh, when they want to protect their uh, property, as as Councilwoman Durham is doing right now with one of her uh, uh, privately owned properties, when you want to protect a property, there's historic preservation as well. All sorts of different preservation methods to make sure that we're sustaining our land, air, and water for the future. As I mentioned, the first item on our legislative package was to limit landfill height. What that did is it stopped a large, uh, you know, waste management, a large, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every year off waste across this country. They just like sort of, they have a habit of dumping it in the poorest uh, and lower income neighborhoods. And we wanted to make sure that insofar as we're using too much, insofar as we're disposing and we need to, to, to put uh, dangerous you know, a, a byproducts uh, of human existence, of living, uh, we need to dump them somewhere. It's important that that burden is, shed, is shared equally across communities. It's really an environmental justice issue. The second thing we did is we supported uh, something called PACE, Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. What it does is it creates financing mechanisms for some of the largest buildings in our county to, um, to, to build green, to transition their energy usage into more environmentally friendly energy usage, and also to increase insulation and things like that so their overall energy consumption is decreased. The third thing we did and we're in the process of doing is we're protecting water quality through the elimination of septic systems in major subdivisions. This is very controversial. And we're taking a lot of heat for it, uh, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, you might know for individuals that build uh, homes or businesses off of sewer system, if there's no sewer line near you, you're building out in distant farmland, you can sort of make a home sewer system that's called a septic system, which sounds nice. The problem is that our sanitary sewer system, which has hundreds of thousands of customers, is run by experts, environmental experts. Um, they're looking at all sorts of things about waste quality, about making sure our our pipes don't leak, that it's very safe for the public and for the long term sustainability of the environment. And septic systems don't have that. It's just, you, you know, one person or one family often in a home trying to manage the septic system. Some people take care of them really well, but other people don't. So we're 
eliminating septic system in large scale development. So if you want to build a development, I think with more than six houses, we put a moratorium on any septic systems in the last two years. Very controversial, very hard to get through. We got it through. And now we're proposing that the uh, moratorium continue um, without a, an expiration date. Currently, it's scheduled to expire in August. And we're trying to make sure it does not expire. Critically important. Not many people pay attention when they're talking about politics. They're often talking about Trump and Biden and, and big issues. Maybe they're watching Governor Carney's very important press conferences in COVID-19. Not many people are paying attention to the elimination of septic systems, but it really makes a difference in terms of the water you drink and the water that comes out of your faucet. The fourth thing we're doing right now is we're preserving and enhancing scenic views along byways. Councilwoman Durham has really been critical in, in this effort. It's been a community-led effort. One thing you learn pretty quickly as an elected official is you can stand up and do all sorts of things uh, on your own, but ultimately it's the people that decide. And so the, the scenic views is really something that didn't come from me. Uh, the idea was not mine. It wasn't even really from my team. It's been an effort, a grassroots effort uh, for years and years. And we now have an ordinance 20-097 that I think is going to be voted on within the next month or two to protect some of the view sheds across our county. Uh, the fifth uh, item on our legislative package is promoting quality private community open space. Not all open space is county parkland or government parkland. Many neighborhoods you go into, the open space you see is actually owned by the homeowners. The problem is that many neighborhood associations is what, what uh, you may have heard is a collective action problem. That if it's not my problem and it's not your problem uh, and it's not her or his problem, it's really no one's problem. Even though we're all supposed to take care of it, too often nobody takes care of it. So this is a piece of the legislation to help address that problem to make sure our open space is taken care of. Uh, and the last thing is con conserving forests and habitats. It's really among the most important, again, not something people are paying a whole much attention to, but among the most important things that we do to make sure as we develop, as we grow, as we make sure there's a plentiful supply of something like uh, affordable housing, uh, which might mean building more houses. We're also making sure we're preserving habitats that Senator Hansen has really been on, on, the, on the leading edge of in the country. Uh, and also conserving forests. Uh, the, the last thing here is uh, enhancing stormwater management through updating the county drainage code for consistency and best practices. Again, you're probably not going to read much about this on the front page of your newspaper, but uh, water, not only water falling from the sky, it's called rain, not only does it give us life, uh, it also can be really harmful. If you don't have appropriate stormwater management, uh, it can be really destructive to homes, it can be destructive to the built environment, and also it can be really destructive to the to the natural environment. So we're working on updating the county drainage code, something that has not happened in decades, doing that in partnership with Councilwoman Diller. The, the last thing I want to say, uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Pierre Paolo, who's going to uh, do a, another sterling introduction of, of Senator Hansen. I want you to get involved. If you're here listening today, if you're here at the, at the Delaware Yes Summit, I know you're here, not just because you want to, I think it's called, and listen to a bunch of presentations. I imagine you want to get out and do something. So I wanted to give you, well, I think it's seven very specific things that you can do and you can do now. I know they say you got to be 18 to vote. You got to be an American citizen to vote, to do any of these seven things. You don't have to be 18. You don't have to be an American citizen. If you believe this is the right thing to do, if you believe in the future of our land, air, and water here in Newcastle County. I want you to get involved. The first thing is twice a year, one of my favorite events uh, that's done in this area is for decades, we've been doing something called the Middle Run Valley Reforestation. We go into a county park, hundreds of people come and, and, we, and we plant and we plant trees. And what's extraordinary is when we plant, you can look and almost see, it's like uh, seeing a history of this event. You can look back 15, 18 years and see big trees, see how they grew. And you can look at your little small tree that you're planting and, and imagine what it's going to look like 15, 20 years down the line. As, as it says there, we've already planted over 55,000 trees. You can also request a rain barrel. We have a rain barrel program we're creating where you, um, you attach the barrel to your gutter uh, and it basically collects the rainwater. And then you reuse the rainwater, not for drinking or anything like that, 
but uh, for, you know, watering plants, gardening uh, and things of that sort. It's a way to reuse rainwater so that you're not constantly tapping your faucet. It decreases your home water uses. The third thing is you can become a clean stream champion. Some of you may already know this program. The most harmful thing that happens in our sanitary sewer systems, I mentioned there are envir- environmental engineers uh, who are in senior roles in our sewer department. The one thing they fear the most is what's called fogs, fats, oils, and grease. When you pour fats, oils, and grease down the drain, it does so much harm to our our sewer pipes and really endangers our, our uh, water system, our, our uh, aquifers, our water system across the, the county and the region. So we're asking people to sign a pledge and get their families to sign a pledge to be a clean stream champion, pledging not to pour fats, oils, and grease down the drain. Uh, the next thing is uh, you can... Uh, Oh, that, that's what, oh, you can become a clean stream champion. You can also take action for clean water. It's a contest and we give awards to the schools that uh, get the most, uh, get the, have the most petition signed, petition not to sign, not to pour fat soils and grease down the drain. I encourage you to participate in Delaware Nature Society's native plant sale on May 2nd to 3rd. I could talk uh, quite a bit about native plants. The problem with that is I don't know uh, nearly as much about native plants as Senator Hansen does. And she has created a, a, an entire body of policy that's done amazing work eradicating invasive species from communities across the state of Delaware. So I'll give her a chance to, she, to she'll she talk about that. But I want you to know that you can make have a direct impact by going and buying a, a native plant from uh, Delaware Nature Society's native plant sale on May 2nd and 3rd this year. Uh, we're doing a comprehensive plan right now. Every 10 years, we update our land use planning, our zoning for the county. Um, and that's happening right now. Tonight at 6 p.m., you can attend a session on housing and economic development. How do we build out the housing we need or build up the housing we need? How do we develop economically, make sure that we can prosper as communities, as families, uh, while still sustaining our environment? I encourage you to send an email to ncc2050 at newcastledet.gov. It's an online session tonight at 6 p.m. Even if you can't make it tonight, send an email to that address. You'll get on the mailing list and you'll see the periodic events we're having. It culminates in early next year. We're going to be producing what's called a comprehensive plan that lays out the zoning for our county. Where do you want uh, housing to be in your neighborhood, in your community? Where do you want parks and open space to be? Where do you want commercial, retail, uh, industry to be across our county? This is the opportunity to have your voice heard. I think it's particularly important that young people engage. For the first time, we have something called a youth planning board. Some of you may be involved in it. I encourage you to get involved in this. And the last thing is just reach out. I think everyone here knows Councilwoman uh, D. Durham. You can reach out to me, the county executive, and there are 12 other county council members. Comment on legislation. There's always every county council meeting, every county, county council committee meeting. There's an open forum where any citizen, any resident of the county can come and talk, can comment on legislation or anything before county council. Make sure your voice is is heard. Uh, you can look up where Newcastle County Council meeting or when county council meetings are held. Right now, they're all online. So it's pretty easy just to log in and participate. So thank you so much for your engagement. Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Durham and Melissa Tracy for starting this extraordinary uh yes summit and pierre paulo thanks for for your leadership and uh back to you thank you so so much mr meyer for your oh, invaluable contributions to our workshop today i already see a great question in the comments but uh let's wait until the end now um if i'm you're hearing me right it says i'm bad connection but it's a great honor to do, introduce to you Senator Stephanie Hansen. Stephanie Hansen graduated from Seaford High School, senior high school, before earning a bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Delaware and a master's degree in earth science from the University of New Orleans. Hansen began her professional career as an environmental scientist and later a hydrologist at DNREC. Senator Hansen currently serves as chair of the Senate uh, Transportation Committee and Vice Chair of the Agriculture Committee and Environmental and Natural Resources Committee. She practiced environmental and administrative law in Delaware from 2001 to 2020 
and served as the chair and vice chair of the environmental section of the Delaware Bar at various points in her career. Senator, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre Paolo. And thank you so much uh, to our county executive for his kind words. And uh, he is such a great partner in what we need to do uh, environmentally in the state of Delaware. And really, you can't do a lot unless you have co good coordination, good communication, and a very good working relationship between all levels of government. So it's a wonderful partner with Newcastle County, and that's very much appreciated. Um, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna kind of concentrate my, my uh, discussion in three areas. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about my background, briefly about some of the stuff I'm gonna be working on or I am working on, and then more about how to become an effective, uh, how to be an effective advocate for what you would like to see um, change. So my background, as, as Pierre Paolo had mentioned, I'm from downstate, I'm from Seaford. I graduated from Seaford High School um, back in the early 80s and went to University of Delaware uh, to major in geology. My mother had no idea what that meant. To this, to this day, she thinks it's geography. Department of Natural Resources and environmental control. And my job was doing um, inspections and cleanups of hazardous waste sites, of leaking underground storage tanks, things having to do with an investigation and cleanup of environmentally contaminated areas. And so I was there for about eight years. And during that period of time, um, I also began to get very involved in doing community work. So I, I started and led my neighborhood civic association and brought in school bus service into our development, mail ser individual mail service within our development. And I thought, wow, you know, um, I bet other developments are having the same trouble that we're having with some of these things. And maybe we could learn from what they were doing. So I formed a larger association of neighborhoods called the Bear Glasgow Council of Civic Organizations. And so over a period of about six years or so, um, I served as the president of that, and it grew to about 80 to 100 uh, homeowner associations and neighborhoods in the Route 40 corridor, uh, from about University of Delaware down to the down to the canal or, or so. And I learned in that process how to become a good advocate for the things that you wanted to get done, how to work with your local elected officials um, in order to convince them that what you're looking for is something that um, is in the is in the community's best interest. And so that's how I've come up with my you know steps for talking with your legislators. Um, while I was on county council, um, I well, I, I ran I I ran for county, the president of county council when I was the chair of the Bear Glasgow Council of Civic Organizations. That was the volunteer position. After about six years, I ran for county council. Um, I won. I was successful and was the president of county council for four years. And in that period of time, did a lot of work um, in helping to write the Unified Development Code, which is the county's land use code. And in particular, my focus was on the environmental sections of the, of the land use code. And to this day, Newcastle County has the strongest environmental standards for development of anywhere in, in the state of Delaware, which is wonderful. And that that is uh, something that the new ca that our county executive now has, uh, Matt Meyer, has a, a wonderful um, emphasis in making sure that we're going even further beyond those things, which is which is great. While I was on county council, I went to law school um, and uh, graduated with my uh, degree in law and began practicing law as an environmental lawyer. Um, right after my term ended on county council, I didn't run again because I was a single parent, so I. Um, you know, you never go into never. If anyone ever tells you, you go into politics to make money, you don't. You go into politics because you have a passion for public service. Um, but at the time, I needed to have uh, be a little bit smarter about taking care of myself and my family. So I became an environmental lawyer, and I was I practiced environmental law for about twenty years. So I've just retired from the active practice of environmental law so I could concentrate specifically on the job of being the senator for the area and doing environmental work in the state of Delaware. Um, I ran for the Senate seat back in 2017. 
um, I was successful in that, was reelected in 2018, and I now serve as the chair of the Senate Environmental and Energy Committee. So that's where I am. I think probably what to take out of that long kind of almost convoluted sort of story is that you don't have to know exactly what you want to be when you're in high school and even necessarily in college. You just have to know what's of interest to you. What is that area, that field that really drives you, that makes you feel um, like you're getting something out of life and that you want to get up in the morning and you want to work on it? And then you study it and then you're nimble within that area. So if you look all the way back from 1980s when I was in um, uh, college for geology, you know, I'm not an environmental scientist anymore, but I'm using those skills and have used them all the way up through working for GenRec, working to help write the Newcastle County Development Code for environmental issues, certainly in the practice of environmental law, and now being on the... Um, the, the chair of the environment and um, an energy committee in the Senate. So don't worry about knowing specifically exactly what you want to do. I think that causes a lot of young people, a lot of anxiety. I have three kids um, and now four, soon to be five grandkids. And I can tell you that uh, young, young people worry a lot about, you know, here I am 16 or 15 or 17, and I'm not exactly sure what I want to do. You don't have to be exactly sure what you want to do. Just get an idea of what are those things that really drive you and work with that. Look at the jobs that are available and be nimble throughout um, the market so you can find the place that really uh, that really works for you. The things that I've been working on legislatively um, have generally fall into the energy and environment sector. However, I do a lot with um, the opiate and, and addiction issues as well. And there are other things that I'm working on also. I have, I have about two dozen bills or so that I'm working on right now. They are heavily weighted to environment, energy, and uh, the addiction crisis, but there are other things in there as well. So for, with regard to the environment, the, one of the things that have really concerned me a lot when I was practicing law was I heard a discussion, a presentation that was given by Professor Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware. And he gave a discussion in which he showed um, how we are losing many of our native species in the state of Delaware. And it's not just, oh, you know, a couple of landmark species here and there. We're talking like 40% of our native birds, 40% of our native plants, 30% of our native amphibians and reptiles, 20% of our native fish. So we're watching a collapse of the bottom half of our ecosystem. And that was frightening. It's frightening. And there were, it was frightening because of the reality of what's happening, but it was also frightening to me because I thought, you know, I've been an environmental scientist. I've been studying this. I've been here in Delaware since the 80s doing this, and I didn't know that. You know, how come I didn't know that? So one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I, I, made, I could do what I could do to get the word out was being in elected office, I formed the Ecological Extinction Task Force, which was basically a group of professionals from the environmental community, the business community, and government as well, to take a look at the results of Doug Tallamy and his students to see, did we agree? Was that for real? Is, are we really watching this collapse of our ecosystem? And that was in 2017. And what we found was, yeah, it is for real. And we need to do something about it. In fact, they came up with 81 recommendations of things that we need to do about it. The first one of those recommendations was recognizing that that was a task force and you need to put in place some, uh, some, something that's going to implement those recommendations. They put in place the Delaware Native Species Commission, which exists today and is now ticking off all of those, um, all of those things to do. One of the top things that we needed to do um, is to ban the sale of invasive species. So there are four things that are contributing, four things that are causing the collapse of our ecosystem. Habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, invasive species, and climate change. 
So we can take each of those things separately. Let's look at invasive species. So I wrote and passed a bill with the help of the native species, with the help of the Delaware Native Species Commission that will ban the sale of invasive species. So that bill passed the House and the Senate, and it's going to be signed um, next month by the governor, and it will be at an environmental summit that's being put on by the Delaware Native Species Commission um, on March the 17th. So you can watch it virtually if you'd like, and you take part of the summit, that would be wonderful. I have a, another bill that's going to um, to ban the sale of the mass, uh, ban the uh, release of, of balloons, the mass release of balloons. So we're working on that with D Durham and Plastics Delaware and many of our partners in the state to get that done. Um, energy wise, I've just passed a, a, a bill that will raise the percentage of renewables that are required in Delaware's energy portfolio so that it could move us much, continue to move us further away from fossil fuels. I have another bill coming on the heels of that that's going to raise it even more and get into place the uh, community solar which will promote more solar um, use. And I recently passed uh, or passed another bill regarding the implementation of uh, more electric vehicle charging stations throughout the state. Because one of the reasons that people are worried about getting electric vehicles is, well, how far am I going to be able to go? Where am I going to be able to charge it? So we need to be make sure that we're passing things that are going to um, provide the groundwork for people to feel comfortable about getting electric vehicles and then being able to charge them when they can. Um, so I'm going to stop with that whole, you know, me and my legislation. And I want to go to how to be an effective advocate, because this is what I spent six years learning how to do and learning how to be when I was the president of the uh, local, the, the Bear Glasgow Council of Civic Organizations. So I'm going to go over some things and then I have some examples for you because I want you to see what effective advocacy looks like. And I think it's important too that you should see what ineffective advocacy looks like. So the first thing, if you want to be an effective advocate, you have to know your subject, do the research, but when you write about it, don't overstate your case because it's sometimes it's a little too easy. To, if, if, if your case can be seen to be overstated, then you start to lose credibility. So don't overstate your case. Understand where the opposition is going to come from, from your ideas. You want to do something, somebody else says that's going to be a bad idea. Why is it that they think that's going to be a bad idea? And if you can look into that and begin to understand that and address that also, in your advocacy, say, well, I know that such and such isn't going to like this because of X, Y, and Z, but that's taken care of because of this. Then all of a sudden you've cut the legs out from the opposition. And that's a really important thing. Know your audience. Are you talking to a state elected official, a county elected official, a federal elected official? I probably get one email a week asking me to vote yes or no on some federal bill because they think that I'm Senator Stephanie Hansen, so I must be in Washington. No, I'm State Senator Stephanie Hansen, and when we're able to be together, I'm in Dover. So I can't do anything about the federal bills that they that they want. So know who your, or who your audience is. Um, and communicate effectively uh, when you do. So number one, in your email, in your letter, whatever you're going to do, be careful to keep your emotions in check. So if you look back over your email and you've got a half a dozen exclamation points and you've got double question marks and you've got all caps, you've got a problem because you don't have as much credibility as you'd like to have. So keep your keep a cool head, keep your emotions in check. And then make sure that you're respectful too and who you're talking to, particularly when you're talking to local officials like our county executive, Matt Meyer, council members, um, your state legislators, and, and even your federal legislators. I mean, the, we, we read these. You're, you're actually writing to a real person. You're not writing to someone that's not going to care, that someone that it's not going to take it personally. You know, I can't tell you how many times I read things. I'm like, don't take it personally. They're just mad. They're upset. You know, you'll see some of those. 
but they don't, I, I think you don't realize when you write stuff that is very strident and kind of name calling sometimes and questioning the motives, you lose credibility. And that's, that's not effective advocacy. That's not going to work the way that you want it to work. And then think about like how, what is the method by which you're communicating? Are you s communicating by email? Email is effective. Email is a very effective way to communicate. Um, a letter in the mail. Um, these days with COVID, uh, letters are actually not as effective as email because you may have sent me a letter and it's down in Dover and it's going to take two months to get to me. Emails are best effective. Things that aren't as effective, though, Facebook messages, text messages, they're not as effective because I can't go back easily and find them when I need to think about something. If you're asking about something and I need to research it, I'm probably going to say, OK, well, I need to ask such and such over at Dell dot. I need to check with this over here. And then how do I get back to this person? Do I get back on Facebook? I have over two dozen portals through which people communicate with me. So it's through Facebook and phone and uh, all the different email accounts that I have, Instagram, all of that. It's really hard to keep on top of all of the information and questions flowing in from there. It's, it's best and easiest if you send an email so that that way I'm, I'm on my email all day, every day. Uh, my assistant is on there all day, every day. It's not going to get lost and covered up and uh, then I can't go back and, and, and find it at that point. Um, anonymity. If you write an email and you're like, oh, I'm going to send this, you know, anonymous. Anonymous has no credibility. So don't send a emails that are you're just signing them by anonymous. It, it, the thought is if if you don't care enough about this issue to use your own name, then why should, you know, why should I care a lot about that issue as well? Like, wh why is it that you don't even want to use your own name? And then template letters. Like if, if your organization has a template letter and they're like, okay, everybody take this letter and put your name on it and send it to your legislators. I get a lot of those. Template letters are certainly better than nothing, right? And the first one's usually pretty good because you read through the first one. But then the second one, sometimes it'll say, Dear insert legislator name, it's they send it to me. They're like, they're not even like looking at it to, to fill in my name, you know, dear legislator name. And then here's the same template letter that I've read three or four times now. Um, it's just not that effective. So, Pierre Paolo, can you share um, the emails that I sent you? I have some actual emails that I received and I've kind of blacked out the names of the folks that sent them to me. Um, for some examples. So let's take a look here. So here we have a bill that's uh, an email that someone sent to me and it was regarding a bill that they didn't like very much. And this was a bill that had to do with collective bargaining by state employees. So here we have, you know, dear Senator, the demo rats in Delaware state legislator have made an absolute disgrace of that august body. Every new bill is an affront to the, to the Delaware and U.S. Con uh, constitutions. Senate Bill 8 is a thinly veiled attempt to increase the power of socialism and its union myrmidiums in the state of Delaware. With all that with all the might they can muster, Delaware's legislators should be fighting socialism and unions, not supporting them. Please do everything in your power to thwart socialism, unions, and their elected puppets. Please fight Senate Bill 8 wherever and whenever it rears its odious, noxious, and oh-so-socialist head. Thank you most sincerely, a Delaware voter. So we can take off all sorts of things that are wrong with this. If you think this is an effective letter, effective advocacy letter, you haven't been listening to anything that I've just said for the last 10 minutes. First of all, demo rats, really? And then it goes into questioning like the 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 motives and the morals of the of the reader. Like what what is he? I don't even know who this person is. I may not even know. They clearly don't know me. And um, they sign it a Delaware voter. They may or may not even live in Delaware. Next. All right. 
Pierre Paolo, next one. Okay, so we have another one here. This is Senate Bill 25, and this had to do with restricting tobacco access to individuals less than uh, 21, 21 and under. So here's what we have. He actually, he did uh, have his correct email address up there. Vote no on Senate Bill 25. It's hard to read this. We are an adult at 18. Don't take the way chooses as an adult at 18 to not smoke. It's not right. The legal age as an adult is 18 years old. Why change the rule now? It's pointless. Beyond being a great argument for continuing to um, push for better, you know, school, this just, this doesn't, this doesn't make the case at all. You know, it looks like, make sure that when you're writing it, you use correct spelling, you use correct grammar, you sign it with your name. It's best if you're writing to your actual senator or representative, because that way, if you put your name and your address and it comes to me, and I can go, oh, look, this is a person in my in my district. And oh, by the way, I will look. All legislators will look. If you put your name and you say, I'm a constituent in your district, even if you don't put your address, you should know that we have lists of all the constituents in our district. So we can go to that list and find out if you're actually a constituent in our district or not. And if you have, I'm a constituent in your district and I vote, we can also determine that too. So make sure that you're right with that. Pierre Paolo, the next one. I'm going to have to cut you short just because we're short on time. I apologize. Um, oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. And Mr. Meyer, if you could come back when you can. Uh, I now open it up. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Senator Hansen, for. You're welcome. I was especially interested in hearing about, you know, what makes a good email, uh, as I've sent many before. And I know over the summer, it was although Black Lives Matter, we've sent many as well. I now open it up to questions from the chat, or if you'd like, you could also request the mic. Uh, there's a two minute uh, limit to that, but. I cannot wait to answer this first question. Oh. Richard McCaskey. Go ahead then. I did pay attention to Senator Hansen, to every word of what she said, but I did occasionally have trouble because I was so excited to talk about the Markel Trail connection planning that's going on. Uh, the native landscaping and plants, I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Senator Hansen, or I'll, uh, Senator Hansen should have the opportunity to speak about it a bit. And I want to make sure I talk about a little bit about what we're doing with county owned facilities and native uh, plants. Uh, the first thing is the Markel Trail connection. So the question from Richard says, can you comment on some of the Markel Trail connection planning that is going on and native landscaping plants on county owned facilities? Is there a master plan online for Glasgow Regional Park? First, the, the, the last question, I do not believe there's a master plan online for Glasgow Regional Park. The, the expansion of parks facilities often happens in fits and starts based on the availability of funding. I just actually learned the last few days that a lot of our parks and pathways work uh, over the last year has not happened, uh, not directly because of COVID, but indirectly because we were using a lot of the staff that we normally use to build our parks and pathways infrastructure to work on our test sites, uh, to help set up our test sites, make sure traffic flow is working and stuff like that. So that staff was was drawn away. We do not have a master plan. If there's a particular issue that you're concerned about with Glasgow Regional Park, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. In terms of the Markel Trail connection planning, back in October of 2018, we announced uh, the Newcastle County Connecting Communities Initiative. I will drop a, uh, I'll drop a link down here in the, in the chat. Um, and what it is, is it's 12 trails uh, that we are seeking to build across the county. A, a framework for it to think about it. It's not true of all the 12 trails, but many of the trails branch off of the Markel Trail. So Markel Trail is effectively what I like to say, the I-95 of Newcastle County biking and pathways. And the idea is to make exits or branches off that. Right now, we are close to uh, breaking ground on phase one of the what's commonly called the Commons Connector. It connects Markel Trail to Commons Boulevard and eventually up to Christiana Hospital. It will link the largest city in, in the state, Wilmington. 
the riverfront with um, Christiana Hospital, largest private employer in this going to go to Newport. Uh, and we're currently in, working on a feasibility study there. We got a grant thanks to the support of Senator Hansen of half a million dollars, $500,000 to, to look at feasibility on that uh, project. The, another framework to think about is how do we connect uh, Claymont and the northern part of the county with the city of Wilmington, the city of Wilmington with the city of Newark, the city of Newark with Lums Pond and C&D Canal, and then C&D Canal on the southern side with the town of Middletown. So we're working on all of those connections. Uh, let me say a quick word about native landscaping and, and plants. Senator Hansen has been on the forefront of that. She called me and got me in and uh, convinced me and the team, along with Tracy Searles, our head of public works, to ban invasive species in any of uh, in any county land. We only plant native plants. We're, uh, thanks to actually, again, Senator Hansen's support, working on a big new library in Middletown, and also Councilwoman Durham's support. And there will only be native plants planted in that library. It's something we're really proud of. Why don't you take, I know you, you referred to it, Senator Hanson. Talk a little bit about what you're working on now with the uh, with the Native Plants Initiative. With the Native Plants Initiative. Well, at this point, we have the uh, we have the ban on the sale that has already been passed. So the governor's getting ready to sign that. Um, the next things that every time you pass a bill, you know, there's always like it, it, then it spawns two or three more other things that you need to look into. So the next things regarding the the invasive species is the um, uh, maintenance, like getting rid of how much is what you, a big issue that we have is now that we've stemmed the tide of no longer being able to buy, sell, transport, distribute invasive species at the point of sale, we still have to address the ones that are here because what makes them invasive is they just keep going and going and going. So how do you eradicate invasive species that are here? So one of the things that we heard through the public hearing process of passing the invasive species bill was now we need to look more closely at what money do we have and who is out there actually eradicating the invasive species that we have? Because we have a lot of various groups that are doing that at different levels Nobody's coordinated with it. And we have a lot of volunteers that want to help as well. So that's a huge issue, along with continuing to update the list of invasive species. Because, what's an, you know, who makes the list? There are thousands of plants, right? We have The list of invasive species that are banned now is, you know, about three dozen or so. Well, we have a lot more of them that are really kind of close to that line. And at what point has enough research been done on those that we need to update the list. So that's the next piece of legislation that'll be part of this is how do we now go in and update that list so that we're making sure that we're on top of all of this. So that's one thing with, uh, with native and invasive plants, but I'm not, I'm sure that that's not what you had in mind. We have 80 different other ones. So if you have any one in particular that you were thinking about, let me know. Good, Pierre Paolo, I don't know if there are other questions or if someone's yeah. going to grab the mic. Share I want someone to grab the mic. I just want to see what happens on Run the World when someone grabs the mic. Um, I invite anyone to test their luck. <laughs> um, but until then, we have a question from Cheryl Siskin. What is being done to preserve Hercules Golf Course as open space? Wouldn't it be another good spot for reforestation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I know Councilwoman Durham, it's actually in there are 12 council districts across the county and Hercules Golf Course is in D Durham's district, as is uh, as is Brandywine Country Club. Um, something that's happening uh, or has been going on the last 10, 15, 20 years, and I guess I'm an example of it. I don't know about you, Senator Hansen, but, but people aren't golfing as much as they used right. to. And uh, I generally think it's a good thing. I'm not the biggest fan of, of golf, uh, but whether it's a good thing or a bad thing doesn't, doesn't really matter. A, a, a downside is that there are all these beautiful golf courses across the county, and if they're no longer financially viable, uh, what do we do? And so, it's a, and so in, invariably, if you own a golf course, what do you want to do? You want to sell it to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder, it's not necessarily – the best uh, use for the environment. It's not necessarily the best use for building community, for sustaining uh, water systems, for improving our 
emotional and psychological health. And so Hercules is one of a number of golf courses across the county that are either at threat of, of closing, uh, Three Little Bakers, uh, Brandywine Country Club, Cavaliers uh, is already going into uh, development. I know Newark Country Club has been under threat. They're all across the county. And so we're trying to figure out what to do because we want the open space preserved. The private landowner uh, often demands sums in Hercules. It's it's more than Councilman Durham knows the numbers better than I do. It's to, to really preserve the whole thing is, is much more than $20 million. Uh, and to it's not like we can like preserve one to, making the financial stretch to try and preserve one of these is difficult because how do I explain to someone in Senator Hansen's district down in Middletown or Tans, Townsend spending their property taxes that were using their money to preserve land in Hercules or even harder? How do I explain to people on the Route 9 corridor who have a real shortage of open space that we're going uh, to an area in, in uh, you know, Greenville, Pike Creek that Hokesson that uh, has, according to national park standards, a sufficient amount of open space and go and purchase a whole bunch more. I personally think it would be beautiful and stunning. And I know Councilwoman Durham uh, has been thinking really creatively and we've been working with her. I think we're, we're if we haven't already, we signed a letter to try and uh, hold off the developer from developing so we can put together resources to acquire it. Uh, some of it, hopefully all of it, but I agree absolutely it would be, it would be a great place to stop uh, reforestation. It's also challenging there. It's it, The golf course is actually built on a big hill, so it's actually not that easy to build. I don't think it's that uh, that perfect a place to build a large-scale housing development, so we're going to do whatever we can to, to, to preserve it. I might have to cut you short again, Miss Hanson. I apologize. Um, there's just a couple things I, I need to get done before our time uh, runs up, and it almost is. Um, quickly, as advertised, there is a raffle for each workshop in which one of you are chosen to win a $25 gift card. So I'm going to quickly spin that. Hopefully this works. And to verify... Okay. Oh. All right. Kupa Mova. Um... Please verify that you are here so that uh, we can get in contact with you um, shortly. And if not, we'd have to respin. Okay, he's there. So that's good. Uh, just quickly, I also um, have here a link for our scavenger hunt as well. And um, finally, I have, uh, I'd like to request for us to take a group fee, which is a feature on here um, in which we all take individual photos of each other and the platform around the world, puts them together uh, in a little memoir that I was here today and attended and learned from these two great presenters. So I'm going to allow that to happen. I ask that you take pictures. Uh, if you're, you know, a little self-conscious, you can put a hand up or a folder up in front of your face, not covering too much, but I'm going to take mine now. More questions because... Actually, there might be time for one last question. I know Ms. Durham talked about, if you guys can't see the chat, uh, she has a draft ordinance to be introduced that will codify Matt Myers' executive order on native plants and strengthen NCC code regarding native plants further in development projects. That's really great. You know, Newcastle County has been the um, really at the forefront. We have three counties. If all, if the other two counties would follow Newcastle County's lead, this would be, it would be a really great thing. And I know Newcastle County and the other two counties are on the Delaware Native Species Commission. And um, I think that the county is also working on a draft ordinance that would encourage people to plant, you know, native plants in their yards. And there is a, um, there's, there's like a, What's the difference between a meadow and tall weeds and grass, right? A meadow 
is not against the county code. Meadows are, are wonderful, beautiful native plant areas. Tall weeds and grass, though, will get you a violation and your neighbors don't don't like it. So what's what makes a meadow versus tall weeds and grass that's going to cause you a code violation? And I think right now, Newcastle County is working on some temp- a template document like that, which can also be shared with um, with the other two counties as well. So, again, we're, you know, we're looking to Matt Meyer and, and Newcastle County to really lead the way for the remainder of of the state. Thanks, Senator. Pierre Paul, can I say one thing? I know our time is just about, but what Councilwoman Durham uh, mentioned in the chat is very important. Her, so we signed an executive order, uh, sorry, an executive order, I think it was two years ago, to, uh, to uh, so ban invasive species uh, and to plant only native species in uh, on Newcastle County on land. What Councilwoman Durham's doing is she's taking